So my point is that, you know, we spend inordinate billions of dollars a year trying to understand obesity, but the cause is simple. That's the cause. And the U.S. government can't acknowledge that it caused the problem. So we don't, we don't ever get to the cause. And, and it's much easier to blame them. They're the cause of their obesity. Much easier. But they aren't the cause, as we'll see. So if we go back now, because I come from Northern Europe, from, from England, and this could have been my great-great-grandfathers. And they were incredibly healthy. Between 1850 and 1870, the Victorians ate a diet which didn't have any processed foods, no sugar. And it had lots of dairy produce, lots of meat, and lots of veg. And these were the working class. And they lived as long as we do. Difference being they didn't go through this decline of health. So they lived and then they died. Not this decline. And they were incredibly healthy. And this is how humans should look. That's what we're designed to look like. I think we need to remember that. But what did they die from? This is what they died from. Other diseases, probably lots of infections or trauma. Trauma, infections, disease of the lungs, disease of the heart, and cancers. What do we die from today? That's what we die from today. Cancers and heart disease. And what's changed? The nutrition. So, in my view, this is, these are nutritional diseases. And I'll talk to you about, cancer, uh, about heart disease, but it's really interesting. In 1940, or not, sorry, 1930s, a guy won a Nobel Prize for showing that cancer cells function totally differently from all the other cells in our bodies. And the difference is that they can only burn glucose. They cannot burn fat. So what happens when you get cancer is those cancer cells just burn up the glucose. They steal the glucose from the rest of the body. And so he said, already in the 1930s, that maybe the treatment of cancer is to reduce the provision of glucose to cancer cells. And how do you do that? By going on a high-fat diet. So I suspect we will find that the reason why the cancers have become so prevalent is apart from the environmental factors, it's the high-carbohydrate diet which drives the production of of cancers because they are glucose dependent. And there are case reports of people curing their cancers on the ketogenic high fat diets. They're only case reports, they're not clinical trials. But that's something to consider. And if I had cancer, I would be on a ketogenic diet the next day. Well, I already am, I am, but, but I wouldn't wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I think firstly, <coughs> the most important thing is for your children. They must eat eggs for breakfast. Eggs, eggs, eggs. Eggs are the most nutritious foods known to man. They're almost a perfect food. They only miss one or two nutrients. So you have to start with eggs. And then you can add, I mean, if you're wealthy, I would add fish rather than bacon. But bacon, because bacon is processed, and so you want to get non-processed stuff. You don't, but th there's a lot of interest in bacon. Sausages are also processed, so you just got to be a bit wary, and you need to get the ones that are made from animals that are raised on pasture. But those are kind of the three basic foods. And well, you can have yogurt, but it must be full, full cream and, and other forces, sources of fat. If you eat fat and protein for breakfast, you will not eat again till 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That's the difference. With this carbohydrates, you're hungry three hours later, and so you have a muffin, and then you have this and that. And all it does is just causes your glucose to go up and down like that. And once your glucose is going up and down like that, you're in trouble. Metabolically, you're in real trouble. Yeah. So that's breakfast, and then, then it's, uh, I might have a snack at 3 o'clock, which might be some cheese or biltong, and then evening meals, lots of veg, and, and meat again, or f no, not meat, usually fish. You know, and that's it. And that's how simple it is. And uh, people said and said, just you eat nothing. And, and, but I do eat nothing, but, but I'm, I'm not hungry. And that's the paradox. And it's, it's called the Yadkin paradox, because Yadkin was the first guy to notice it. What he did was, in 1968, he took six people on their traditional diets. He found out exactly what they were eating, calculated carbohydrates, fats, protein, and then he put them on the low-carb diet. He was one of the first to use the diet in, uh, in medicine. And he noticed what happened. The hunger went away. The hunger went away, but they ate less calories and they ate, le ate less total fat, which is surprising. So on this high-fat diet, they were eating less total fat. Because when they were eating the previous foods, the high-carbohydrate foods also have lots of fat in them. So if you cut them out, you cut fat. 
but, but they lost their hunger, even though they were eating less and less fat. But we say calories drive hunger, and fat drives hunger, or the reverse, that you've got to eat calories and you've got to eat fat to inhibit your appetite. He showed the exact opposite. When you cut the fat and you cut the calories, your hunger goes. Why? Because you cut the carbs, and the carbs are driving the, 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 the appetite. So that's how I see it. I used to say, eat more fat because that satiates you. I don't think it is. I think it's take the carbs out, and then you're not overstimulated to eat. Yeah, um, Lucas. By, bypassing the um, egg and bacon, yeah. what would your um, thoughts be on a um, 40 grams of butter and uh, yeah. coconut fat in yeah, uh, espresso? The yeah, that's right. yeah, that's right. Breakfast. There you go. Yeah, there you go. The other option is just to go full fat. I, if I was to say that, people would say you're mad. But you're quite right. Yeah. Butter is a hugely important, and coconut oil is fantastic. But what you're describing is an 80% fat diet, yeah. Yeah. Which, is, which is very, very healthy. Yeah. Did yeah. you eat no chocolate? No. <laughs> I have not had chocolate for nearly three years now. I don't understand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so, so let me tell you, yeah, I, must, I have diabetes, and I measure my glucose relentlessly. And... Uh, the, it's, I'm already on fully medicated on a thing called glucophage. So I can take no more medicine. So now I've cut my carbohydrate as low as possibly can to keep my glucose low. Because I, I think that glucose is absolutely critical. So, but if I, take glucose, if I take any sugar, my glucose just goes off the, off the cars. So I just have to be... So I'm extreme. And, and I, in fact, give, I give that message because I see so much bad medicine. I'm, I'm, I'm in the, the bank yesterday, and a guy walks out like this, and he says, Oh, Dr. Nox, tell me about your diet. I've just lost my leg from diabetes, and the other leg, I'm about to lose it. He says, but I can't eat low carbohydrate. He says, carbohydrates in all foods. I said, that's not. You can eat this, that, and No, no, oh, you know. I you not It frustrates me. This guy's going to lose his leg. I said, you're going to lose your legs. You're going to have strokes. You're going to lose your kidney function. He said, oh, but I've got some apples in the car. They're good for you. I said, no, 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 no. So my, I, I'm extreme, because I think that if you have diabetes, you better be extreme. Yeah. So that's why I've had nothing for, for three years. And that's why I'm so lean. You know, yeah. and, 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 but it, but it's, it, it's a, it, it actually is no effort. But the point is, I am very disciplined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I was to eat chocolates, what happens is, I'll show you, you get your, the addiction comes straight back again. It's addictive foods. And the people who fail on this diet... They do very well. I mean, I had one woman who reported she lost 20 kilograms in six months, which is good. She put 20 kilograms in two months. She put it back in two months because she started eating carbohydrates and she, the addiction came straight back. Because I'm going to show you it's an addiction. Yeah. These foods are addictive. Yeah. You get in a, I mean, a, no diet is sustainable. It's got to be marketed as a lifestyle. Yeah, so, yeah. It's yeah. That's right. <coughs> And, and that's the key. So, and, I, and I just feel so much better, and I know what I used to feel like. You know, so, so there's, yeah. Okay, so if you have anyone who's got cancer, please tell them they must stop eating carbohydrates. I'm not saying it's going to cure them, but it may well delay the progression. And for brain cancers, it's definitely the only treatment. The traditional treatment for brain cancer is useless. You will die within six, weeks, we, six months. We know that. There's no treatment. On this diet, they've had people prolong it for four or five years. South Africa is really interesting because we had the Rinder pest, which wiped out the, the cattle in the 19, early, late 1800s. So the Rinder pest arrived in the Horn of Africa, and then it spread right through. And it had a huge impact on South African health because it took the, the Africans lost their cattle, and as a consequence, they had to go and work in the cities. And that was, the, that was a tragedy to their health. Urbanization was a disaster because they lost their real source of food. And so, so this is what the guy said, loss of large number of cattle caused considerable social and economic distress with the disappearance of their source of meat and milk. So notice meat and milk, because people always say Africans eat putu pup. And I, that, I don't think that's true. I think if you go back 100, 200 years, you'd find that they ate meat or they ate animals. They used to catch animals. Africans experienced considerable hardship and in some cases starvation. Impoverishment caused by rinderpest contributed to growing proletarianization and labor migration. So that was a catastrophe for South Africa, in my view, the, the rinderpest, and it's not been recognized. 
And if you wanted to improve the health of our local populations, you know, you'd put them back to eat what they traditionally ate, meat and milk, not the pup that they're eating. Okay, so one of the guys who really noticed the effect of urbanization on the health of the Africans was G.D. Campbell. And he set up a clinic, the first diabetic clinic in South Africa at the King Edward's VIII Hospital. And he immediately noticed that most of the people he was treating were, livers, were people living in the towns, with very few living in the country. And then he went out into the country, looked at the Ishawi Hospital, and he noticed that they had very few cases of diabetes, despite a larger population, few cases. So he said there's something about urbanization that causes diabetes. And then he noticed amongst the Indian population, remember they'd come from India to work on the sugarcane industry, and he noticed that their incidence of diabetes was tenfold higher than the population from which they arose in India. And the, the Natal Indians were eating much more sugar. And he came up with a theory that the sugar is causing the diabetes. And he was the first person in the world ever to suggest that. And I suspect he's probably right. And he also noticed that it took time before the diabetes would appear. It took about 20 years. So these are the number of people with diabetes that he saw and how long they lived in the city. And after about 20 years, then you can see that this sort of peaks after 20 years and beyond. So he said that diabetes develops after you've been eating a high sugar diet for 20 years. And he eventually wrote s some books about that. And if we look now at the global pattern, this is for sugar consumption, very low in the 1700s, then it rises. And diabetes is uncommon before 1900, and then only in wealthy people. But then it becomes more prevalent as the sugar is eaten by all social classes. And here you see the rise in diabetes, and they match each other quite closely. So there's a lot of interest that sugar is a major driver of ill health, and perhaps could be the major cause of diabetes. I suspect it's a marker of many things, but it may well have its own toxic effects. But that's one of the problems, is that now sugar is just so prevalent in our diets. Okay, and they wrote this book, The Saccharine Diseases. Uh, here's G.D. Campbell. And this was published in the 1960s, and it lists a whole bunch of diseases linked to refined carbohydrates. And they were all demonized, and no one really had paid much attention to them, unfortunately. Okay, here are some books, uh, if you want to know what influenced me. This is Gary Torbs, who wrote this book, which is absolutely required reading if you're a doctor or a nutritionist. Fantastic book. It's an absolutely brilliant book. You know, you, if you really want to understand nutrition as a lay person, whatever, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. And it really starts the, the low-carb movement globally, starts with this book. And he's really interesting because he's a fabulous guy. And he just says, well, I know I'm right. You know, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't care how much I'm criticized. People are going to have to accept. Yes, that's right. Why We Get Fat is kind of the shortened version. Yeah. This is, this is just a wonderful, wonderful book. If you've got an interest in history, it's just full of history. Yeah. And Russell Smith wrote this book, which is, was a shortened version of a book which was 1,300 pages long. So if you think there's no cholesterol conspiracy, well, how could he write a book of 1,300 pages long? And this one is shortened down to 400 pages. And in fact, the first chapter tells you the whole story. So if you have heart disease or your family member has heart disease and they're taking statins and you want to know a little bit more about the, the evidence or the lack of evidence for the value of statins, this is a really good book. Um, and it, it's a bit complex perhaps, but it's, at least it's, you should know it's out there. Now where I think medicine has gone wrong is we've got the wrong model of disease. And our model today is that if you have a condition, it's caused by one thing, and there's only one treatment, which is a drug. And that's wrong, because many factors cause disease. But we've simplified medicine to this. So if you come and see me, and let's say you have diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and high cholesterol, I'm going to give you four different drugs. Or I'm going to give you five different drugs. But what if they're all caused by one thing? And that's the question. So I'm going to show you in my view, that, that it's your nutrition which causes obesity, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. And if you reverse your diet, you don't need any of those medications at all. Get rid of all the medications. 
but we don't ask that question. So we treat each condition as a separate disease without understanding they may all have a common cause. And so in heart disease, it's high cholesterol and we give you statins and that's it. That's it. Nothing else. Um, I'm going to tell you somewhere along the way how valuable are statins. So all of you, I'm sure, have had your cholesterol measured because we're all trying to be healthy. And there may be some of you who are on statins. So let me tell you if you've not had a heart attack. So if you're healthy, like all of us here, and we've not had a heart attack, and you go to the doctor, and he measures your cholesterol, and it's 5.1, and he puts you on statins, what's the prospects for you later on? Okay. So if I took, the, these are the raw data. If I took 1,000 people like that, no heart disease, cholesterol of 5.1 or higher, and treated them for five years, how many are going to benefit of those 1,000? <laughs> okay. I, it turns out 18. 18 are going to benefit. So 982 will get no benefit from the medication. 982 will get no benefit from the medication. So you have to ask your doctor, when he prescribes statins, how much benefit am I going to get? And the answer is, only 18 are going to benefit. And I ask all the audiences, I say, how many people do you think should benefit for you to want to take the drug? And most say 500. If 500 of 1,000 benefit, I'll take the drug. But if it's 18, there's no way I'll take a drug. Okay, there's a downside because drugs carry risk. The evidence is that if I treat those 1,000, between 6 and 30, between 6 and 30 will develop diabetes as a direct consequence of taking the drug. So you've got 18 benefits and theoretically 30 may get diabetes. And the doctor gives it to you as if it's, as if it's Smarties. Okay. My view, there's no way you can justify giving statins to a healthy person because there's equal risk that they're going to get diabetes as a result of your treatment. Yeah. Now, why don't the doctors ask that? Why don't they question that? And the answer is this, because they've got the simple model of heart disease that if you eat this fat, you get high cholesterol, and then the cholesterol, cholesterol causes arterial damage. So if I can lower your cholesterol, however, I'm going to benefit you. But what I've shown you is that these statins do lower your cholesterol dramatically. So you might go from a cholesterol of 6 to 4, and you think, oh, that's fantastic. I'm going healthy now because it's below 5, and therefore I'm never going to have heart disease. Nonsense, I've shown you. You're still going to get heart disease if you've taken the statins, but it may take you a bit longer to develop it. But the answer is, this has got almost nothing to do with that. That's the problem. Yeah. Wave or wonder over somebody and remove all cholesterol. They would, they would die. Instantly. They would die. Yeah, they would die. I mean, you have to have it yeah. in your body, which not many people yeah. are aware Thank of. you very much. Yeah. yeah, cholesterol is probably the most important nutrient in the body, most important chemical in the body. The most, and we try to stop its production. It's astonishing. So, so the problem is that this has almost got nothing to do with that. There is no way, there's no pathway by which cholesterol can cross the artery. No way at all. It has to be damaged. You have to have a damaged artery, and then the cholesterol will get in. So in my debate with Professor Rousseau, he said, oh, no, it's a mass effect that the more cholesterol you have here, the more it gets across the artery. There's no, there's no pathway for that. There's no biological pathway for that. Yeah. Just as there's no, there's no pathway by which saturated fat produces the LDL cholesterol. No pathway. In reality, yeah. that's is that not doing what it's supposed to do? Because you've got inflammation in your artery, the cholesterol's there, so it acts as a band-aid, heal it, and then move on. Yeah. But when you continue with the glucose insulin cycle and the inflammation stays, the longevity turns yeah. into plaque, yeah. and that's where yeah. the problem yeah. comes in. So it's a byproduct of yeah. glucose insulin cost. Exactly. That's the, that's the parallel universe. Yeah. So the one universe is that the cholesterol just goes across there if you've got too much in your blood, and it damages the arteries. And the other is that it's getting across there because the artery is damaged and it's trying to patch up the damage. And those are two totally opposing views. Yeah, and the evidence for this one is much better. The evidence that it's protective is much better. Yeah. But, but we know that statins wouldn't work because the, the first drugs that lowered your cholesterol had no effect on heart disease whatsoever. None at all. So lowering your cholesterol, you cannot predict the outcome. But the statins did both things. They lowered cholesterol and they reduced heart attack risk very slightly. So that was the savior for the industry. 
but they probably act in some other way, preventing inflammation. And then you get all these, these diseases. But I, I haven't brought the slides today, but what I can show you is that the, more, the higher your glucose and the higher your insulin, the repeated spiking, that's what damages these arteries. And the best predictor of your health is your blood glucose level measured at any time of the day. And the lower it is, the better you do. Cholesterol is a pathetic predictor of risk. It's absolutely pathetic. It has essentially no value in predicting. <coughs> okay, so now we come to Ansel Keys. So where did it all go wrong? Ansel Keys wanted to make himself famous. And he got, sat down one evening. He had some data of 22 countries where he had data on how much fat was in their diet and their heart disease death rates. And he found these six, which made a nice straight line. And he tossed out the other 18 and stuck with these six data points. And so what he said was, you see, it's fat in the diet that causes heart disease. The a better relationship, which he had at the time, was sugar. Sugar was a much better predictor of heart attack risk because it, it encompassed all 22 countries. But when you cut just down to six, the fat was reasonable. Now, what you have to understand in science is this is an association. This is an association between one thing and one thing. It doesn't mean to say that this causes that. And the only way you can prove that this causes that is to do a trial where you reduce or increase the amount of fat in a diet, and then you measure what happens 40 years later to heart disease rates. You can't just assume like this. And unfortunately, he assumed that, and he managed to convince the world that this was good science that an association co proves causation. And tragically, it doesn't. And they didn't do the clinical trials where they reduced the fat intake to see what happened to heart disease rates. So this is an associational studies, and associational studies prove nothing. They prove absolutely nothing. They may give you an idea about what you might want to research, but they do not prove anything. For example, what he's implying is that the only difference between a U.S. male and a Japanese male is that these guys eat more fat and they eat less fat. And they exclude smoking, exercise, other aspects, social class, a whole bunch of stuff. Can't do it. These guys then got together the, the Govern, uh, McGovern Commission, which was a Senate committee which decided they were going to produce new guidelines for what we should eat. And on the basis of that evidence, and that evidence alone, they decided you have to eat. You must reduce your fat intake, you must eat vegetable oils, reduce cholesterol, eat more carbohydrate, especially grains. Just going back to the other yeah. slide, I mean, you, you almost need the other, the full 22 dots yeah. to show that yeah. absolutely no correlation yeah, between right. what it is, and you manipulated it blatantly yeah. Yeah. to get the result you wanted to that's get right. the initial. That's correct, uh, yeah. And then when you flip to that other slide, it just shows you what a farce it is. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Good. So, and this, these guidelines were drawn up by this guy who was a vegan and no training in nutritional sciences. Now, it's unbelievable, but you have to read Gary Torbs to see that this is true. These guidelines were drawn up by people who had no knowledge of the nutritional sciences at all. And they set the world on a different path. Now, it turns out that the manufacturers of vegetable oils got onto this and they drove it because they were the major <coughs> beneficiaries. And there's another article or a video on called The Oiling of America, which describes the role of the vegetable oil industry in distorting the science. They actively distorted the science so that everyone would believe that saturated fat is bad for you and vegetable oils are good. And that the growth of the industry started thereafter. But many people said it's not true. What right has the federal government to propose that the American people conduct a vast nutritional experiment? That's it with themselves as subjects on the strength of so very little evidence. Now remember when Professor Rousseau debated me, he said they've got irrefutable evidence, or you have to have irrefutable evidence. They had none. There was not one single clinical trial to show that these guidelines would be healthy. Not one single clinical trial. So they put the whole world on this experiment without any evidence that it was going to be good for them. It was purely speculation. And here he said, it seems that the proponents of this dietary change are willing to advocate an untested diet. It was untested. And this, he was one of the leading guys published here. And they will not 
acknowledge that it was an untested diet. And what happens in science is that if you do produce something and now that's the truth, it's very difficult to dislodge it because the whole U.S. funding industry is to protect this diet. So the National Institute of Health will not fund studies of low-carbohydrate eating. They will only study high-carbohydrate diets. And that's, you just have to understand that's how science works. So it's easy to defend this because the whole, the whole government influence is to prevent the, 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 the proper trials being done. But it was an untested diet, and these people won't recognize it, acknowledge it. So here's a, a little video clip um, of, of the Ansel Keys disaster. I don't know if, I hope, it, I hope the sound works. If you could pack oh, okay, all it's of not. human history into Let one me just year, put this in, yeah. farming and eating grain since about yesterday, which is when we became short. No, we're not, we're not going to see it. It doesn't matter, really. So we'll. The next thing that happened was Richard Nixon came along. And he wanted to do two things, to make farmers wealthy and food prices come down. And he put this guy, Earl Butts, in charge. And Earl Butts industrialized the production of corn. And so he put all these small farms together. And his statement was, get big or get out. That's what he told the farmers. Get big or get out. And they were able to reduce the cost of food. And that's why food is very cheap today. It's too cheap. That's part of the problem. And the farmers got very wealthy. And this is the farm bill, which makes sure that the farmers get funded to grow soy and corn, both of which are foreign to our bodies. They're not what we co-evolved with. And corn then becomes the basis of the food for North Americans. And apparently this farm bill will never be revoked. It's impossible to revoke it because you will just take on all the farmers and that's a disaster. So there will always be subsidization of corn and soy, both of which, neither of which we need in our diets. Now, if Keyes had been around today, he could be completely disproven using his own approach. This is the relationship between the total energy from saturated fat in the diet and mortality rates in European countries. These were published in 2008. And you'll notice that the more saturated fat, the lower the rate of heart disease. The exact opposite to what he said. And these are real data of all the countries in Europe. And you'll notice that these countries have lower rates than these. And these people are eating less saturated fat. And I would argue that I think the saturated fat is protective, but I can't say that. I think these people are eating more sugar and more vegetable oils, and probably less in these countries. Because the more saturated fat you eat, the less vegetable oils you'll eat and the less sugar you'll eat in general. So if you want to be really healthy, go and eat like the French and the Swiss eat. That's, that's what you're eating. Go and find out what they're eating. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, but they, yeah, but they eat other good things and they don't eat much sugar. And, so, and the Coca-Cola and so on. But I s they are changing. You're quite right, they are changing. And their mortality is rising as a consequence. But the traditional food is high fat. There's more fat in these diets, as you can see. Yeah. Okay, so that's the science. Now then, sorry, that's not the science. That's association. Now there are other associations where we take individuals and we see what they eat for life and you see what they die from. And this also shows, this is an associational study. If you follow these thousands of people, it was found that there was no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with increased risk of heart disease or cardiovascular disease. And that's published in 2010. So these are people who have been followed. They eat a particular diet. You follow them for 40 years and you see what do they die from. And there's no linkage between saturated fat and the diet and what they die from. Okay. So that, is, that tells us that there's no reason why we should fear saturated fat. So if a nutritionist or a cardiologist tell you to avoid saturated fat, it's bogus. There's no evidence for it. But remember, this is association. This is where people did the same thing all their lives. What happens when we change their diets? Well, we get the same thing. Here, this is studies of people who have changed their diets. They've reduced or modified the dietary fat, 
and there's no clear evidence for an effect on total mortality. In fact, their evidence is the opposite, that if you're sick and you change your fat intake, you get, you get less healthy. Okay, so which is paradoxical. Because what it shows you is that that diet's particularly dangerous for unhealthy people. Yeah. So, those, so therefore, the idea that fat causes ill health is not proven. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. And if then we buy, base our whole dietary advice on removing fat from the diet, we did it all wrong. So here we go. So this is our diet that we're told to eat by the 1977 dietary guidelines. And what had happened, it took all these nutritious foods, which are really full of nutrition, and it replaced them with this rubbish, which has no nutritional value whatsoever. Just, and I'll show you that in a second or two. And we were told that these are full of vitamins and nutrients, and it's absolute garbage. The nutrient-dense food is here. And this is absolute rubbish, and particularly this stuff. Pasta. Oh. <laughs> and potatoes. And these breads. They, and they're all genetically modified now, so they're quite different than they used to be. And so that's what happened. Surely potatoes were eaten by cavemen? Um, they may well have been, and, but... Yeah, that does, yeah, they may well have been, but in probably in limited amounts. Yeah. The, yeah. Talking of the of sort of the, the more modern grain versus the, yes. the no the ancient grain. Yeah. So you know your um salt and, and those kinds of things. Oh, does that negate a bit of what's the, the sort of bad carbs? Yeah. See one of the, the big question is how quickly can you adapt? How quickly can the human adapt to a new diet? And the new grains came in 12,000 years ago if you lived in Persia, but only 2,000 years ago if you lived in Northern Europe. So for me, as an Englishman, I've only been exposed to grains for 2,000 years. And it's probably, that's too short a time. Is 10,000 years enough? I don't, we don't know. We generally would think it's probably 100,000 to 200,000 years you need to adapt. So if the food was being at 200,000 years ago, then probably it's much more acceptable or more likely that we've adapted to it. Yeah. I might, I'm just going to take an aside here, but I don't know if you know, there's a lovely theory that we're all, we're all genetically linked to a population that lived 200,000 years ago, that all of us are related to a population. And that population, it looks like, was down to 600 breeding pairs. So 200,000 years ago, all humans were wiped out except for 600 breeding pairs. And the reason was because of climate change, and it was very cold. And the guy who's proposed this theory is from Arizona State in the <laughs> United States. And he said, if that is true, if there was a small population living, where would they have been living 200,000 years ago, given that all the rest of the world is in, in, have, inhospitable? And he worked out it had to be in southern Africa, and he worked out it had to be near Mossel Bay. Yeah. And he started in 1993. And he went to the, to, the east, to the east coast, the southeast coast of, 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 of uh, Mossel Bay and areas, and he looked for caves. And he found one at Pinnacle Point, which where it's been hab habitated from 200,000 years back or forward. And he believes very strongly that this is the truth. And why was it true? was because 200,000 years ago, the intercontinental shelf, was the water had been completely taken out, sucked out, because it was all in the ice in the north. And so you had this whole new area of land sitting off the southeast coast of, of southern Africa, which had f um, fish and other things. Had. And he believes that humans survived because they got hold of the fish products and the mussels and so on. And, but they also could hunt on land, and they could also eat the bulbs of the, of the Cape flora. And so that's the theory, and we're actually about to start studying how do the bulbs that we eat, that, we, that are available in the Cape flora, how do they affect our metabolism? So that's kind of the original grains of, of the actual Cape flora that we ate. Yeah. And I, I suspect he's going to be proven to be true because the genetic evidence is so strong, and now he's got the, the artifactual evidence and, uh, from, the, from the digs there. 
Okay. So these are modern. We used to eat Cape Flora. <laughs> That's what we ate. Just to make the point that the relationship between heart disease, here's a rise in heart disease and disappearing in the United States. Notice it starts to fall already in 1960, which is unexpected, because Keyes came along here in the 1950s. He'd already, the rise had already happened before he changed things. And the variable that most closely links to that is cigarette smoking. And you can see as cigarettes come up, they rise in heart disease. As they go down, the disease disappears. So we look for a nutritional explanation for something that probably is caused by smoking. So Keyes' work here was probably a waste of time. Should have just told everyone to stop smoking and would have got the same effect. Yeah. This is an Australian who took on the sugar industry and then he took on the oil, the vegetable oil industry, wrote this book toxic oil, where he looks specifically at vegetable oils. And you can see he lost substantial weight. He stopped eating sugar and bread and reduced himself. And he said it's insane to say that ancient foods cause modern diseases. And that's the reality. And I always ask the doctors when they tell me that what causes heart disease, I say, well, what do your people eat? You know, they eat high carbohydrate diets. So I say, well, doesn't that suggest that maybe it's the cause? I hadn't thought of that. <coughs> So what are these foods? If you're eating these foods and you had cereals and grains for breakfast, I'll just tell you what you ate. This is what you ate. You just ate a box of sugar, glucose. Just that's all you ate. Yeah. And the body, the glucose is highly toxic. And, and my view is the following, that the reason we have insulin to, is to get glucose out of the bloodstream because that's where it's really toxic. And then you get it into the cells and if the cells can't take it up, they put it into fat because they've got to get rid of this glucose because it's so toxic. And there is evidence now that sub breakdown products from glucose are damaging to the heart. And the people with heart failure are particularly sensitive to high carbohydrate diets and their hearts work less well on high carbohydrate diets. So that's, that's what we've been told to eat, glucose. Now why do we need glucose? We don't need it. Your liver produces all the glucose you need from whatever it's available, the fats and the proteins. So my diabetic problem is because I've got this liver that just pumps out glucose all the time. All the time. doesn't matter what I eat, it's just pumping out glucose. And the old argument was that your muscles don't take up the glucose. That's not the problem. It's part of the problem. The real problem is that glucose is just being overproduced. So humans have this incredible capacity to produce glucose. So we don't need to eat it in the diet. And that's what our diet has become. This highly toxic substance, which the body doesn't need, and we're just pumping our bodies with it all the time. Here's a guy who wrote in 1958, the body has no need for carbohydrates. Just remember that. No need for carbohydrates. When you hear the sugar industry saying sugar gives you go, it's nonsense. Carbohydrates provide calories and nothing else. A man given carbohydrates alone would literally starve to death on calories. While he was dying, he would break down his own proteins to provide materials for the repair of his key organs, and he would lay down the carbohydrate surplus as fat. So the point is that carbohydrate, you either burn it as a fuel, or you store it as fat. There's nothing else. You can't build your brains or your lip muscles or anything on carbohydrate. Protein and fat allow you to build your body, but not carbohydrates. And so what are we doing? We're forcing our young people to eat more and more carbohydrates. And we wonder why they don't develop their brains and their bodies. Yeah. So if you want to go and see the really big, strong people in the world, go and find the cannibals and the carnivores. Yeah. <laughs> then you see the big people. And so this is a tragedy. And the, and the problem is that, that we're making our children eat more and more and more carbohydrate in the crucial times when they should be eating protein and fat. So children should be raised on protein and fat. That's what they need. And we don't. We go and buy them these little things which are full of carbohydrate. Just look at how much carbohydrate is in those purity products. They are full of carbohydrate. Why? Because it's cheap. We make lots of money selling cheap carbohydrates. I have two grandchildren, they are both being raised on the paleo diet. So they just only get fat and protein. Yeah. And they, they're loving it. Yeah. And that's the way to go. 
And if you actually give children, if they haven't been carbohydrate addicted already, if you give them the choice, they go straight for the fat and the protein. They don't choose the carbohydrate food. Yeah. It's an interesting, interesting experiment. Okay. Um, this is a marvelous book which was published earlier this year. And this guy infiltrated the industry and discovered that the industry realized that by adding, adding salt, sugar, and fat to foods, they become addictive. And they realize that if you want to make a lot of money, you've got to produce addictive processed foods. And he found records going back to 1999 where the main CEOs of the main producers of processed foods met in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, to discuss the problem of obesity and diabetes. And guess what? They all agreed that they are the cause of the obesity epidemic in the United States of America. So here are the guys. These are the companies. They all met. And the one guy, I forget which, I think from Kraft, he got up and he said, we've got to do something about it. We cannot continue to sell our products as they are because we're going to kill all Americans. And the next guy got up and said this, don't talk to me about nutrition, talk to me about taste. And if this stuff tastes better, don't run around trying to sell stuff that doesn't taste good. In other words, if it's nutritionally sound but doesn't taste good, I'm not interested. And that was the end of the debate. So we have evidence that in 1999, these companies met and acknowledged that they are the cause of the obesity and diabetes epidemic in the United States of America. My, def my profession doesn't have a clue what caused the beast in diabetes. But the guys who are causing it, no. Who's causing it? Yeah. And those are the companies, and these are the other the subsidiaries. So there are 10 companies that produce 80% of all processed foods. And if you want to prevent the beast in diabetes, you have to take these companies on. And so the US government has a choice of either sort, sorting out its fiscal deficit by taking these companies or by doing nothing. So that's the challenge. It's a marvelous book, uh, that one as well. So these are the two of the big A's. <laughs> Ask for more. That's it. Yeah. And how do you get rid of these two companies which are causing so much problems? That, that's the question that Lucas asked. It's interesting from our point of view that these companies support research that promotes the idea that obesity <laughs> is caused by being inactive. In other words, if they can prove that it's inactivity, then you can do your exercise, have your coke, and you'll be fine. And that's not true. Because obesity is an addiction, as I'll show you. And one of the drivers are high fructose, high corn syrup diets, high fructose corn syrup foods like Coca-Cola. So these drugs act in the part of the brain that heroin and cocaine act, the same parts of the brain. Carbohydrates and particularly fructose act in the same part of the brain and drive you to search for more. Yeah. So, if we look at humans, it took us millions of years to get to this perfect specimen. Now, the reason why this guy's lean is because his brain regulator is absolutely controlling how much he eats in relationship to how much he exercises. And it worked for three million years. Now what they come along and say is, now actually what's happened is now we've become too inactive. And that is nonsense. Because if this animal becomes less active, all he does is he eats less. That's it. And he <laughs> remains lean. And you see that go to the Kruger National Park and see the lions. They're not fat. Why? Because they've got a regulator which tells them you're hungry, go and hunt. And then they hunt. And when they're full, they don't hunt. And then they get hungry again and they go and hunt. That's how the system works. And it works in all creatures except humans exposed to addictive foods. And as soon as you introduce addictive foods, you get trouble. So that's the way we were. How did we get there? Over the last three million years, if you were here three million years ago and I was giving this lecture, we'd all be three foot tall and we'd look like this. And this is Australopithecus africanus, who was discovered in, in southern Africa, first one in 1920s. 
and he was a vegetarian. And today we look like that, and we're omnivores, but I would argue mainly carnivores. And the question is, how did we get from there to there? It's a huge change. And the answer is because we became hunters. And we were able to out-hunt or outrun other animals in the heat particularly. And there's a paper just out yesterday showing that also we became incredibly good throwers. So this whole mechanism of throwing, and that's why baseball pitchers and cricketers are able to bowl at such speeds, is because we have this incredible mechanism here which allowed us to throw. So the mechanisms that made us human were hunting and throwing. That's what our bodies. So this is, this is a runner's body. And the reason we got there then was because we became hunters and we could hunt in the midday when we needed to sweat. That's why we sweat so much. And the animals we were chasing don't sweat. So we could outperform them and they would get hot. And for 3.5 million years, we did very well without being told what we should eat. Because we followed what our brain told us. It knew what we should be eating. And I claim it still knows what you should be eating. You just got to listen to it. And this is how the brain evolved. And notice, remember we spoke about the, the 200,000 years? That's where the brain really starts to grow in the last 200,000 years, in the people living in Mossel Bay and eating the fish and the mussels and so on. So I'm part of that experiment. And what they've shown recently is that they asked people to go and hunt for, for shellfish and things along the coast. And within two hours, they produced more food then it would take you hours and hours of hunting to collect. So it, it's an incredibly rich source of food, the sea. And it looks like this is probably why we suddenly got such a big brain, was we started eating fish and other things along the sea, fish, uh, along the, the sea coast at uh, Mossel Bay. So, so there, we, there we go. So, but our brains are dependent on a high-fat, high-protein intake. Okay, I'm just going to show you, I'm just going to finish the, this is the old theory you've been taught, energy in, calories out, that's why you get fat. Uh, it's not right, it's the failed homeostat model. You have a homeostat in the brain which tells you how much you should eat. And, okay, sorry, I'm just, <laughs> here's, here's one of the guys we were successful with. He lost that amount of weight in, in seven months. He li yeah, this is where he goes. This is 28 weeks, starts at 160, ends at 78. Yeah, yeah. And no, ex no exercise. You don't need to exercise. Yeah, exactly. This is a doctor who cures himself of all these conditions. And this is why I say you know, that, the, that these conditions are due to high carbohydrate diets. He cures himself. This was, he was uh, 57 at this age, and he told his wife, I'm going to die before I'm 65. And now look at him. He's very healthy, happy. And, okay, we won't go through. Bruce Fordyce also did very well on the diet. Oscar Chalupski and myself. Uh, this is, this, I'll just finish, oh, sorry, I'm, you shouldn't see it. This is a guy a year ago, he runs the two oceans, and uh, he runs it, and this time, 6.57, he just breaks the, the, the seven-hour barrier. And look at him, what he looks like. He's healthy, comrades runner, you see. And he's had a terrible time, and his life's a disaster, and he speaks to me. I said, Simon, you've got to change. And one year later, remember where he's finished? 6.57, one year later, this is what he looks like. He runs 3.59. 3.59. He dropped three hours. Yeah, and he wins the silver. But this is the key. He goes from that. So why is he like this? He's, this body stuck in that body because he's been told to eat lots of carbs by Tim Noakes. That's the problem. Once he cuts the carbs, he's like that. And uh, you go to the comrades and... Yeah, 80... I was actually in my class. Was he? Was he? And he was the fastest long distance yeah. runner yeah. Good 10 years and getting a fat. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So he had, that's why it wasn't the weight loss that caused that. It, he trained a lot, but it was getting off the carbs that helped him. Yeah. 
So, so which is better? So my point is that all those comrade runners who look like this do not need to look like that. They could look like that if they would just change their diet. And these are the healthy people we look up to and say, gee, look, we ran the comrades. But they're not healthy. They can be better. Okay. So, and there's another lady, a South African doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in one year. And she had an addiction to Coke and pasta. So I'm just going to, um, this old model you know, this one, you, you eat too much and you're slothful and gluttonous. It's your fault. You're obese because you don't do enough exercise. That's garbage. And so you've got to be disciplined to lose weight. And the problem with this one, it doesn't have a brain. Here we go. It does not have a brain. And the brain is a regulator because it matches intake to output. And this is the real model. And the real model is that it's addictive foods. And if you have a brain that is slightly addictive, you're in trouble. And the thin people are the ones who don't have this addictive brain. And they can eat a little bit of carbohydrate and stop eating. But there are a large proportion of people who that doesn't exist. And they unfortunately have an addiction. And carbohydrates drive that addiction. And until they appreciate that, they cannot lose weight. And so that they, they can go on a, a high-fat diet, they'll lose weight. But as soon as they just be exposed to sugar again, off their weight goes immediately again.